Hello everyone, welcome to 2020. Hopefully you all had a great holiday season and a happy new year. Uh, I know I did. It was a great relaxing time with friends and family, but I'm back now. It is time for me to start making videos again. So, a uh, lot to cover, mainly um, on the New Japan side of things. Uh, we're going to kick things off right with a review of Wrestle Kingdom, a show I highly enjoyed, and talk about all the events that happened throughout the weekend uh, regarding New Japan, but I have a few more things I want to get into, or a few additional things I want to get into before we cover that, because the Wrestle Kingdom talk is going to be long, because it's uh, you know two really long shows, and then there's some New Year's Dash sprinkled in as well. So, uh, before I get into all that... Um, I want to pull up the top 10 matches for December 2019. So let's get the year started off with the end of last year. Let's pull up my list. Where are you? Alrighty. Okay, so I admittedly did not watch a lot of wrestling in December. I kept up with AEW and NXT and NWA. Other than that, I kind of fell to the wayside. Didn't watch much Impact. Didn't watch much... Um, uh, MLW didn't watch any Ring of Honor at all. They had a pay-per-view and I didn't even watch it. Final Battle. I think this might be the first year I've missed Final Battle in quite a while. It's I mean, maybe a decade. It's that's how far Ring of Honor's fallen. Where Battle Final Battle's coming up, I'm like, nah, I'm good. But anyway, so if this list feels a little off, um, keep in mind I did not watch a whole lot of wrestling. Obviously, I didn't watch any Raw and SmackDown. I can't remember the last time I watched Raw and SmackDown, but. In any case, uh, let's go right into it. Number 10, the Young Bucks versus Santana and Ortiz from a Texas street fight. Uh, this was on the December 11th episode of AEW Dynamite. Uh, and number 9, the next week's uh, big match, uh, Chris Jericho versus Jungle Boy in the 10-minute challenge. This was from the December 18th episode. Uh, number 8 is actually an MLW match from the Opera Cup, the first round. Members of the Dynasty clashing, MJF versus Alex Hammerstone. I thought, you know, the heel versus heel setup was done very well. Uh, with MJF uh, playing more the heel and Alex Hammerstone actually proving he could kind of get over as a babyface if put into the right situation. I thought the way these two played off of each other was actually really good and a great way to do a heel versus heel, partner versus partner style of match. And I really enjoyed it. So uh, that gets the number eight spot. Number seven, Colt Cabana versus Ricky Starks versus Aaron Stevens for the NWA National uh, championship in a triple threat match from NWA into the fire. Really fun match. It was the mid-card title match of the show, and I thought it went really well. It was really entertaining and really fun, and one of the better matches on the show. Number six, Cody and QT Marshall versus The Blade and The Butcher from the December 11th episode of AEW Dynamite. Uh, I thought The Blade and The Butcher had an impressive debut, uh, debut match, I should say. And I like the presentation of the Blade, the, uh, the Blade, the Butcher, and the Bunny. Uh, Ali has never looked hotter uh, than in that getup, and I think the overall presentation is great. There's been some talk about how AEW has too many uh, dark cult style gimmicks with the Dark Order, the um, uh, Brandy's group. I've already forgot the what was the name of it. The Nightmare Collective, and this group, the Blade, the Bunny, and the Butcher. I think um, the Triple B group is the best one of the bunch and I like that they're I like their style as a tag team because they're just an old school bruiser tag team which I think the tag division needed because there's too many flip floppy guys and I think having a little variety goes a long way and I, I really liked how they came off in this match and I thought the match was uh, pretty good uh, next up also from AEW Dynamite this is from the December 4th episode the Young Bucks and Dustin Rhodes versus the Inner Circle in a six man tag uh, excellent match with Dustin hanging in there with all the young guys doing their flip floppy stuff and it was uh, a lot of fun and some really good stuff uh, now we go into NXT from the December 18th episode Shayna Baszler losing the NXT women's title to Rhea Ripley um, really good match and the end of Shayna's title reign so obviously it mattered in, in the grand scheme of things uh, but the match I enjoyed even more was the NXT title match from uh, that same show. It was actually the opener. Adam Cole defeating Finn Balor, a match that um, uh, was probably Finn Balor's best match in a while. Uh, like, really good stuff. And Adam Cole, I guess you could say he closed out his 2019. He had an excellent year, and he closed it out strong with another really good championship match under his belt. Uh, number two, also from NXT, uh, the December 11th episode. Finn Balor versus Keith Lee versus Tommaso Ciampa in a number one contenders triple threat match where all three guys look great. I know there were some complaints about um, uh, Keith Lee eating the pin and Finn Balor going on to face Tommaso Ciampa. I kind of feel like there's still room for Keith Lee to grow and they can, um, as long as they don't, 
Bianca Belair him and just completely destroy him because uh, Bianca Belair, I, I've said it before, she's a rare case where NXT horribly misused somebody and derailed that person, that talent, and that talent just never got back on track in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, hopefully they don't do that with Keith Lee. I think they, hopefully they recognize they've got something there with him that people are latching on to, and I think he offers a very different style of talent that normally holds the NXT title. So it, it's, um, I see a huge upside to Keith Lee, especially, I think they tapped into something, especially around Survivor Series time. So hopefully they continue to do that. And But I thought this match was very good that showed off the strengths of all three men. And um, Keith Lee was the real star of the match, though. And uh, I think a lot of people were disappointed that he didn't win. But like I said, I think there's still a chance to push him into something special. I'll cover that in a little bit before we get into Wrestle Kingdom. But uh, my number one favorite match of the month goes to the old school two out of three falls match for the NWA world title. The main event to NWA into the fire. Nick Aldis successfully defending against, against Cowboy James Storm. Uh, really good old school style of match. Great. It had a big match feel, even though it was in that little tiny dinky studio setting. Um, this is a match that felt like it was like, yeah, this this should this is the world title match without question. And I really enjoyed the match. I thought it had a good old school flavor to it, and uh, was really good overall. A very solid pay per view main event for NWA. And that brings me to brand of the month. My answer might surprise you. I think in the current state of the Wednesday Night Wars, um, nobody expects me to say Raw or SmackDown for obvious reasons. Um, but I think when you're talking brand of the month, most people would probably expect me to say either AEW or NXT. I'm not doing that. I'm going to give it to NWA. Um, I thought they overcame their problems really well with the Cornette situation and then following up the Cornette situation with a clip show, basically, uh, which seemed to tick a lot of people off. And I felt like they were able to overcome it, put on a really solid pay-per-view at Into the Fire that, again, it's... Brevity was probably the best part of that show. It just breezed by it. It was so delightful to watch. And they followed it up since uh, with the, well, the debut of Marty Skrull, which was big. And then the couple of episodes of NWA Power that have followed have probably been some of the better shows that they've done since they started. So, um, you know, to start it, like, I think in December they were right around the time of the Cornette scandal. And for them to kind of rebound and come back, put on a solid pay-per-view... And also put on, followed up with some really strong shows and, you know, the formulation of Nick Aldis's heel faction and Nick Aldis finally going full heel and uh, the TV championship tournament, which is, I've actually been really enjoying, even though I question why the, they don't need a third belt since the roster's not that big to begin with and they already have the national title. But it, I've really been digging the tournament and I think it's been a good showcase for a lot of the characters on the show. And, uh, yeah, NWA Power's been great, and I think we have Aldis versus Marty to look forward to, and um, they did really well in December, so I'm going give, to give them the nod for Brand of the Month. That's how that's going to play, and we'll see if that continues in January, because they have another pay-per-view coming up, Hard to Kill. I'm a little surprised they're having another show so soon. I, I also find it funny that this weekend, uh, Impact's putting on their show, Hard to Kill. Actually, I think I screwed that up. NWA's doing hard times. Impact's doing hard to kill. There we go. I think I've got that straightened out now. Uh, I made a joke on Twitter that's like, yeah, Impact's hard to kill, NWA's going through hard times, and WWE is hard to watch. I'm, I'm so clever. I'm so fucking clever. Um, no, I'm not. But uh, in any case, uh, that wraps up the top 10 matches of December. So from there... We're going to go into a topic regarding the Royal Rumble. Now, again, I have been watching Raw. I didn't watch the Rusev, Lana, Lashley wedding angle with the lesbian twist thrown into it. I didn't watch any of that shit. I didn't want... I, I just haven't been watching because I don't care. Like you, it, Raw and SmackDown are at a point right now where it's like, look, you cannot pay me to watch those shows. Um, Raw's been awful and SmackDown's on Fridays. I'd rather, I'd rather go out on Fridays. That's just how it is. And, you know, the other shows, they're either, you know, Wednesday, I'm home, I'm not doing anything, so AEW is going to get the nod there. NXT shows up on the network, so I can just watch that whenever I want. I typically watch it on Saturdays. And then you got NWA, AEW Dark, MLW Fusion, those all pop up on YouTube. So it's like I'm subscribed to them, I get them, and I watch them whenever I can. So uh, there's a huge... Uh, there, there's no reason for me to watch Raw and SmackDown, is basically my point. But something happened on Raw this week that I saw a little bit of a meltdown for on Twitter. And I want to talk about it and maybe kind of sort of defend the WWE a little bit. A lot of it's going to depend on the execution of what they do at the Royal Rumble with this. But, um, major talking point. 
Brock Lesnar, the WWE World Champion, is entering the Royal Rumble at number one. Now, uh, some people don't like this because of the prize that goes along with the Rumble. Whoever wins the Rumble gets to go for the World Heavyweight Championship, or a, a world title of their choosing, um, either the Universal title or the uh, WWE title. Our guess is the NXT title, uh, depending... I, I don't know how far they want to take that rule, but... Um, some people were complaining, and I understand the complaint, where it's like it's stupid for the world champion to be competing in a match for a shot at the world title, and the world title's not on the line, so it's not like a few years ago when Roman Reigns was the defending champion in the Royal Rumble, which I thought that was a little silly, but um, because it was just setting up Triple H and Roman, we all saw it a mile away, and I'm like, I don't want that match. <laughs> I, I really don't want that match. But anyway... Um, uh, I'm going to start this off by saying I'm shocked that the WWE has never exploited this loophole before. Where, and a friend of mine a few years ago, so this would have actually, longer than a few years ago, this would have been uh, around the time Edge was like the, the top guy. So we're talking like 07, 08, 09, somewhere in that range. Uh, so over a decade. Um, he had the idea of Edge trying to win the Royal Rumble while he was champion so he wouldn't have to defend the title at WrestleMania. So it'd be like a heel. So it's like a low risk, high reward where Edge could uh, enter the Royal Rumble. And if he wins, he can basically avoid having to defend the title at WrestleMania and still get a WrestleMania payday out of it by uh, making an appearance or something. And it would be like a, a swarmy, dirty, weasel heel tactic to save the championship. That's not what Lesnar's doing here. It's a different situation entirely. But, um, you know, that idea was presented to me over a decade ago, and I'm shocked that WWE never took advantage of that loophole because they've never, as far as I know, they've never explicitly stated that the champion cannot be in the Royal Rumble once they put the rule in effect in 93 where the winner gets to go on and face the champion at WrestleMania. They've never said that the champion couldn't participate in the match. And I kind of liken it to... The IWGP World Heavyweight Champion competing in the G1. Uh, like it's recognized that the winner of the G1 is most likely going to face the IWG World, uh, the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion at Wrestle Kingdom. But I, I think every year since I've been watching uh, the G1, uh, the IWG, IWGP World Heavyweight Champion has been in the tournament. So it's you know it gives. Um, it creates an interesting dynamic because it's like, okay, what happens if the champion wins? So I'm actually a little intrigued by it. I'm like, okay, it's it's different uh, from what we normally get at the, uh, out of the Royal Rumble. And after so many years of doing the Royal Rumble, the fact that they could come up with something that we haven't seen before, that's intriguing. Uh, so I'm a little, I'm like, okay, that's actually not so bad. And Lesnar going in at number one, it reeks of... You know, Alexander the Great, he sat on the rock and wept, for there were no worlds left to conquer. And it's like, uh, Lesnar's kind of taking the fact that it's like, well, I beat everybody, so I'm just going to jerk off to myself, basically. Where it's like, alright, I'm going to enter the Royal Rumble at number one, I'm going to try and beat everybody, and just sh take a giant dump on everybody. And, again, it's all it's all a matter of the execution. And with Lesnar, I mean, Lesnar typically doesn't go that long, so maybe my ideas aren't going to happen. But, um... There are two ideas that I have that they can use to really make this work. Uh, number one, and this has been thrown around online, so I'm not necessarily like a genius for coming up with this, but it's, uh, I picture it in my head, like Lesnar goes in at number one and systematically one by one, 28 straight guys, he just eliminates them all one by one. Uh, maybe there's a couple hope spots, maybe there's a few double teams in there, but generally, Lesnar just throws out everybody. It's taking the Diesel spot from 94 to its extreme conclusion, where Lesnar just throws out fucking everybody. Just throws them all out. Uh, just one by one, just beats the shit out of everybody, throws them all out, uh, before they have a chance to gang up on him or do anything. Because Lesnar is that level of dominant uh, uh, of a performer. He's, again, he's basically the new Undertaker in that sense, where you just believe that he could beat ten guys at once. And, um, alright, so he throws out 28 straight guys, and that's just the whole Rumble match. And again, I, I can see people shitting on that, but I kind of like the idea, because it's Again, it's so different from every other Royal Rumble we've ever seen. And I, I kind of like it when they're able to come up with new things to present that match. I remember back in, uh, I think it was 2009, where um, 
it, I think that match set the record for the most Royal Rumble entrance entered in the ring at once, where there were like 15 guys in the ring at one time. And some people complained about that because, you know, it's too many bodies, it's too clusterfucky, you can't really tell what's going on. I liked it because it was like, I mean, within the rule structure of the match, something like that could happen. So the fact that it happened, to me, was really interesting. It's like, oh my god, half the participants are in the match at one time. Uh, that's never happened for, before. That's really interesting. And um, I kind of got a kick out of it. So uh, to me, this would be, if they did like what I'm suggesting here, that would be an absolutely insane thing to do. And I think I could see people shitting on it, but at the same time, I think it uh, it could work, especially if it has this ending that I've come up with. Number 30 comes out, and it's a guy who challenges Lesnar and eliminates him. And that sets the stage for Lesnar's big championship match at WrestleMania, where his challenger eliminated him from the Royal Rumble and prevented his perfect rundown of the entire Rumble match. And actually, if they do that, the, to tell you where I got the idea from, in No Mercy, there was a... Um, and no Mercy, No Mercy, the N64 game, I should say. Uh, there was a survival mode, I think it was called, which is basically a Royal Rumble, except there are a hundred participants. And I made it my mission, every time I played it, to eliminate all the other participants. Just eliminate everybody. You have a perfect score and eliminate everybody. I did it once. And only once. It is so fucking hard to do. Uh, because so many things happen and guys can get thrown out of the ring at random. And one bad hit from one of the computer players and you go down and you can be eliminated by pinfall and submissions. And if you take enough damage, you lose. Uh, it's so hard to actually do that. But I did it once. And now I'm basically applying that booking to the Lesnar situation. So... Uh, but then, you know, he eliminates the first 28, but then gets eliminated by 29, or who would be number 30 in the Rumble. And who could that guy be? Keith Lee. That's my pick. That's uh, When I think of, like, all the guys in NXT that could be a potential physical match for Lesnar, who could be a fresh match that we've never seen before, a guy who got over uh, recently and has captured somewhat of a spark in NXT, and Got some people noticing him at the Survivor Series. Have him go up against Lesnar at the Royal Rumble and destroy Lesnar's perfection, his total dominance of the Royal Rumble, where you know he eliminates 28, but doesn't get that 29th and doesn't get that perfect Royal Rumble win as the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And that's like a thorn in Lesnar's side leading all the way up to WrestleMania. You get Keith Lee versus... Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, uh, a Haas match, if there ever was one. I, I think that would be a really cool setup. The other thing they can do, Lesnar wins the Rumble, in my idea. He just one by one eliminates everybody all the way to 29. He wins. He eliminates everybody. What does Lesnar do? Okay, so like I said, this isn't the dastardly, like, weasel heel move that I was talking about with Edge. This is, like, Lesnar being a monster and just destroying everybody and dominating everybody. So what does Lesnar do with the Royal Rumble win? He challenges the Universal Champion. WrestleMania, it's the Fiend versus Lesnar unification match. And fucking hey, I want a unification match because WWE is too many belts. So I'd be down for that in a heartbeat. And I think this would be a really interesting match to do because... Uh, and I admit my misgivings about how The Fiend is presented with the red lighting and everything and the, the finisher spamming, like him getting hit with 18 curb stomps is just fucking ridiculous. Uh, that said, the intrigue here is the fact that you have two guys who have been booked to be the most unbeatable guys on the roster in different ways. Lesnar is the guy who throws everybody around and dominates them and takes them to Suplex City and makes mincemeat out of them. I mean, he destroyed Cain Velasquez at the last uh, Saudi show, and he generally dominates most of his matches. So you have that guy, and then you have The Fiend, who can take an insane amount of punishment and not stay dead. Um, this is a guy that should have been stretchered out in Hell in a Cell, the way that stupid match was booked. But and he ultimately walked out on his own two feet and actually dom and actually destroyed the guy. So I think there's you have these two like indestructible forces, and I'm like, I kind of want to see that match just to see what they do with it because it's going to be wacky and weird. Now again with the Fiend, please drop the red lighting for the love of God, just drop it. But. Um, for all the failings of the WWE's booking, and Lord knows I could say plenty, uh, they've kind of failed into a situation where they've created two guys 
who are seemingly unbeatable. And I'm like, well, fuck, put the two unbeatable guys together and see what happens. See if you can make magic with that. I think it would be a very interesting pairing. And, um, but yeah, we'll see if they do that. So like I said, like this whole Lesnar situation that seems to have some people uh, kind of riled up and not liking it, I'm like, I think there's potential for some creativity here. I'm kind of interested to see what they do with it. It's, it's the first, I mean, I'm more, I'm way more interested in this than that fucking uh, Rusev, Lashley, Lana, fucking Liv Morgan, Trapezoid, or wherever the fuck that nonsense is. I'm like, you could not get me to give a shit about any of that. But this Lesnar thing, I'm like, okay, I'm intrigued. I'm actually intrigued. You have my attention, WWE. And Royal Rumble's coming up, so we'll see how all of that goes. Um, this will be... Uh, I'll be paying close attention to that Royal Rumble match, because I am going to watch the Rumble, even though I don't watch Raw and SmackDown, because fuck it. But uh, I, I think that there's potential to do something really cool and creative there. Now, if this is like when Jericho... I, I reference this a lot as a great Royal Rumble... All-time great Royal Rumble fail. Jericho comes back, says nothing for weeks... Then the week before the Rumble, he says, this Sunday, the world will change, the world as you know it will change, or something to that effect. Goes in, wins the Rumble, or he loses the Rumble, Sheamus won, and we never found out what Jericho meant by that. And then he just attacks CM Punk randomly the next week. It's like, wow, that was anticlimactic as fuck, you dumb losers. Fuck you. Um, actually, I think he waited until Elimination Chamber to go after Punk. I, I don't know. Fuck, fuck it. But... Uh, whatever way, it was anticlimactic and boring. So this could very well turn out to be something anticlimactic and boring. But I'm intrigued. I think the situation is very, very interesting. And it's uh, captured my imagination and my attention a little bit. Do they deserve my attention and my imagination? Probably not. But I'm intrigued to see where it goes. So I'm actually defending the WWE here. I think this is actually a really interesting move. Um, and I look forward to seeing what they do with it. So, with all of that said... It is time to go into Wrestle Kingdom, the two-night event, New Japan's biggest show of the year, the Tokyo Dome event with the daring two-night format. Uh, three if you count New Year's Dash, and, you know, it's a bit risky to do two big dome shows back-to-back, -back, uh, you know, one night, uh, or a two-night event. And, uh, yeah, it's a risky thing to do. Gotta, like, you know, if night one is too good, it raises expectations for night two, and... Uh, are they going to burn out the crowd after so much, after two really long shows? Because I think, um, I watched it on the Fight app, and I think both shows were close to five and a half hours when you count the pre-show. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a lot of wrestling. <laughs> that, that is a lot of wrestling. But, I'll say it, uh, I thought Wrestle Kingdom was great. I really enjoyed both nights. Uh, very entertaining all around. I, I would say that I enjoyed... Here's the thing, I think night one had my two favorite matches of the weekend, but as a complete show, I enjoyed night two more, and I'm going to go into detail as to why that is, but uh, I thought both nights were stellar, just great night of action, big matches, big moments, uh, some really good payoffs, and I overall was very entertained by the double night dome event, and uh, my hat's off to New Japan, uh, they absolutely killed it this weekend, I thought it was great, and it, it's... It goes to show, like, um, you know, because I've had the idea that WrestleMania should go to two nights at this point because it's so goddamn long. It's like, dude, just split it into two nights. Just stop it. Just, you're, you're fucking being annoying with this. And I think this show proved, it's like, okay, that can work. A two-night stadium show can absolutely work and be great. So uh, I think maybe that would be a better way of WWE presenting their show. But that's just me. Um... But anyway, let's get into the show itself. Uh, I'm not going to cover the pre-show matches because they were just fluff. I mean, they, were, they weren't bad, they weren't good, they were just fluff. They were just there to warm up the crowd as they were filing in. And to that end, they were successful, but they're not worth going out of your way to see. They're just kind of fluff matches that are there. We did get a title change for the Never Open Weight six-man tag titles. Uh, titles that I feel should not exist. Uh, one of my knocks on New Japan is that they have too many belts. And that is definitely one set of belts that could go. And um, LIJ won the belts for anybody who cares. I don't think anybody really cares about those championships. I, I don't know why New Japan feels the need to have three sets of tag champions. Uh, when you have the... Okay, I can understand the differences between having a heavyweight tag belt and a junior heavyweight tag belt. I don't understand the need for a six-man tag belt. It's just a complete waste of time is my opinion but that that's how it is so uh we're not going to talk any anything more about the pre-show matches uh let's start off with night one i've got the card pulled up here it was the first of two 
Jushin Thunder Liger retirement matches. This one was basically the Legends match where Jushin Thunder Liger, uh, the legend Tatsumi Fujinami, uh, the great Sasuke, I love Sasuke's mask, by the way. Uh, I thought that was really good. And Tiger Mask uh, taking on Naoki Sano, uh, Shinjiro Otani, uh, Tatsuhito uh, Takaiwa, and Taguchi, that guy who is, I think I said in the preview, he's the youngest guy in the match, and he's like 40 years old. Um, oh, one thing before I get into the specific matches, uh, my only issue with the, my only major issue with the show the entire weekend um, is that I watched it on the fight app, and there were instances where the audio cut out, especially there was a moment during Jericho and uh, Tanahashi where the audio caught out for like 30 seconds and that was annoying. And there were also moments where they cut out the theme musics. Like Liger's theme music was replaced with like this generic liter lyricless version of the theme. And there were sometimes where they just straight up muted the entrance, which was very distracting. Like the Gorillas of Destiny, their mu their entrances were muted. Um, all three shows. Uh, or well, they didn't wrestle on night two. So two shows uh, for the event. And there were they did that a few times. It was a little distracting, a little annoying. Um, now, New Japan World, I heard that the stream crashed a couple of times, especially uh, night two after Liger's retirement match. I heard that the, there were a lot of issues with the stream uh, going forward from there, but I didn't watch it. I didn't watch uh, the live stream of the event on the Fight app. I just watched, because um, I'm not staying up till five in the morning to watch a wrestling show. That ain't happening, especially when I, got a, I started my new job this week and I've got to get up early. And, uh, you know, travel for an hour and a half in the morning. Uh, I, I won't have to be going to the office every day, which is great. But I had to travel an hour and a half on my first day to get to the headquarters. So um, I, I was not going to fuck with my sleeping schedule too much the weekend before. And um, so those were the only major problems I had with the show. And it was audio issues and it was a little distracting, a little annoying. But whatever, they, they didn't want to pay royalties for the theme songs, I guess. So... That was that. So, um, anyway, we had Liger's first retirement match. The first of two retirement matches. And uh, this was the eight-man Legends match. Again, it was all the old guys. And um, I both enjoyed and was terrified by this match. Because uh, I was impressed by the stuff that some of these old guys were doing. Like Sano doing a fucking suicide dive. And uh, Fujinami basically just went in and did his dragon screws. Um, not Nothing too crazy, but... Uh, Liger obviously put in a little extra effort uh, for his, uh, you know, one of his final performances. And some of these guys were really kind of working harder than I expected them to. And I was entertained by it, but at the same time I was like, whoa guys, be careful. That, that double stomp that you just did is like, uh, you, you ain't young men anymore. Uh, don't need you breaking your ankles or anything crazy like that. So, uh, but I enjoyed the match. Uh, predictably, Liger lost. He ate the pin. Uh, his, you know, meeting up with tradition of going out on his back, and, uh, oh, but overall, I thought the match was entertaining and fun and a good way to start the show. And, um, I guess a good, uh, kind of, good way to set the tone for the weekend of Jushin Thunder Liger, the final weekend of Jushin Thunder Liger, and, um, uh, this wasn't the emotional match, but it was a fun one. It was an inter entertaining one. It was basically just Liger working with his friends, which is uh, obviously something that he requested, and uh, it was entertaining for what it was. Uh, next up, we had another eight-man tag. Uh, we had Suzuki Gun members Minoru Suzuki, Zack Sabre Jr., Tai Chi, and El Desperado taking on members of LIJ, Los Ingobernables de Japón, uh, Sonata, Evil, Shingo Takagi, and Bushi. Um... This was, uh, again, fun match. A good solid eight-man to kind of set the stage for the matches on, in Night 2, specifically Zack Sabre Jr. and um, Sonata. Um, to that end, it was fun. It was also cool to see Suzuki on the card. Um, he didn't have a big match this weekend, although he did have a big moment. I'll talk about that when I talk about Night 2. And uh, so it was a very typical, like, New Japan eight-man in that regard. But it was fun in, in that way, and it made me excited for... Uh, Sabre Jr. and Sonata for the next night. So to that, to that end, it succeeded exactly what it was trying to do. And um, Suzuki-gun got the win, and uh, we have um, Sonata versus Zack Sabre Jr. to look forward to the next night. More on that later. Uh, then we had our third, um, third straight eight-man tag team match. Normally, that would be a criticism for me, but I think in the two-night show format, it was like they're still in warm-up phase to kind of get people ready for the big matches. 
And uh, so I was okay with it. If this had actually been like one Wrestle Kingdom card and they opened with three straight eight-man tags, I would have been annoyed by it. But since it's a two-night event, I was like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. We, we've got a, many, many big matches to come. So I'm not going to complain too much about it. Uh, this one, it was uh, Bullet Club members Kenta, Bad Luck Fale, Yujiro Takahashi, and Chase Owens taking on members of Chaos, Hiroki Goto, Tomohiro Ishii, Toru Yano, and Yoshihashi. Uh, again, this was meant to set up matches for Night 2, specifically the Never Open Weight title match between Kenta and Hiroki Goto. Uh, Chaos got the win here, and I thought the match was fun. Again, another fun, solid 8-man tag where I got to see Ishii be a strong brute by giving a brain buster to Bad Luck Fale. I got to see Bad Luck Fale act like a giant. Um, and again, I say it all the time with him, I like Fale. He's a big guy that acts like a big guy. There's nothing wrong with that. And he uses his size to his advantage. I think he's very effective in his role. And uh, you got to see some comedy from Toru Yano. Uh, it actually showed that he has good chemistry with Bad Luck Fale. And I'm like, kind of want to see that match now. I kind of want to see that match just to see uh, Yano uh, kind of like run away from him and, and see what other like weird tricks he would pull out to try and take down the Giants. So uh, overall, this was fun. I thought it was an entertaining match. And Chaos got the win, and again, that set the stage for Kenta versus Goto in Night 2. So from there, we move on to our first title match of the weekend. Um, the Gorillas of Destiny, with a muted entrance on the fight app. Thank you, guys. Uh, defending the IWGP Tag Team Championship against the team of David Finley and Juice Robinson. Fin Juice! Fin Juice! I'm sorry. Uh, fin Juice is the name. And... Um, I thought the match was good. Uh, I'll be honest, I've never been that impressed with David Finley. He's one of those guys that has like a little bit of positive buzz online. And I look at him and I go, I don't see it. <laughs> I just don't see it. But I think he did a little bit better in this match. I think being in there with a team like Gorillas of Destiny and being in there with someone who's as over as Juice Robinson kind of helped elevate him a little bit. And uh, overall, I thought it was a good, solid match with a somewhat surprising title win. I did not expect the Gorillas of Destiny to drop the titles here, but they did. We have new tag team champions, and uh, Juice Robinson basically got to come out of the Tokyo Dome with the tag titles as somewhat of a consolation prize since he didn't ultimately win the U.S. title at night two. Spoilers, sorry. Uh, but uh, overall, I thought it was a good, solid, fun tag team title match. Uh, nothing overly special, but fun for what it was. All right, from there, we have four straight singles matches, which were really the lifeblood of the first night of competition. Uh, we started off uh, these matches with the Texas Death Match for the IWGP United States Championship. John Moxley going up against the champion who won the title after Moxley vacated the title for missing the show due to the uh, tsunami and all that other stuff. The typhoon, I think it was. And... Um, so we had this match, Texas Death Match. So I'm expecting, oh God, Moxley's gonna go crazy again like he did with Omega. And I don't know if like the, the reaction to the match with Omega kind of forced him to like, okay, I can't go crazy here. No thumbtacks, no glass, no fire, no staplers, no, none of that crazy shit. I won't go too crazy with it. So it wasn't as hardcore as I was expecting. Um, didn't go too nuts with it. Uh, but it was a really good brawl like a really good hard-hitting brawl between these two and this match was kind of the culmination of lance archer's uh, great year where he's like kind of reinvented himself and reinvigorated his career because up to this point he was like a low he was a another face in tna that accidentally got over with the impact zone for like a month and then he went to wwe and was kind of a no-name guy there then he became known as kind of a tag team guy in new japan and now he's stepped into this role. It's like, oh my God, he's actually really good. Uh, he had a kind of a breakout performance in the G1 this year. And I think this match was kind of a culmination of his ascension into something a little bit more special than he had been for most of his career. Because I've been watching this guy since 2004. Like he's been around a long time. And I was never like overly impressed with him. I thought at best he was a solid hand, but here, it's like, dude, he's been killing it this year. When you look at his matches with Osprey and this match here, I thought this was a really, really good wild brawl um, that didn't milk the 10 counts too much. It was pretty much a straight-up last-man-standing match, and I like that they didn't milk the 10 counts too much because that could kill a last-man-standing match if you're doing it too much. It just becomes too repetitive. I felt like they avoided that. And uh, they had some table spots that were a little uh, that were that were nice and brutal. 
they had one spot where uh, Archer picked up one of he was standing on the apron he picked up one of the young boys one of the young lions and he choke slammed him into Moxley I'm like that was different that was pretty unique and cool and overall I thought it was a very good match uh, best match of the show of night one thus far up to this point in the show and Moxley won the United States Championship, winning back the title that he never officially lost, setting the stage for a title match with Juice Robinson in night two. Um, I thought this was very good, and it, it offered something a little bit different that the rest of the that neither show had uh, both nights. This, this this was the hardcore match. This was the the brawl, the just uh, down and dirty fight, and um, uh, I like that. I, I like that it stood out among all the other matches on the show, and I thought it was very good for what it was. So thumbs up to both guys. I thought it was great. Then we had Hiromu Takahashi challenging and defeating Will Ospreay to become the new IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. Now the storyline here was obviously Hiromu coming back from injury and uh, Will Ospreay who had had this excellent year. I mean, it's, I feel like Ospreay always has a great year, but he had like an exceptionally good year this year of being like the guy in the junior heavyweight division and being the guy when it comes to holding that title. So Hiromu, if he's going to have this redemption story and this grand return, he's got to beat the best junior heavyweight in the world. I think this was arguably the match of the weekend. Um, the emotion involved from Hiromu uh, coming back from injury, stepping in and having a match this good, to Osprey healing it up a little bit so that uh, Hiromu could kind of be the returning hero in this match. And even the little psychological nugget of Hiromu breaking out a new finisher instead of the time bomb to ultimately put Will Ospreay away. Uh, I, I thought this match was excellent. This was an absolutely outstanding match. And of course, I've seen the gift passed around where that amazing spot where Ospreay did the over-the-top rope dive, landed on his feet, Hiromu uh, grabbed him for a German suplex, Osprey like flipped out of it, landed on his feet, went back into the ring, wearing bed out, and did the flip dive all over again. And all in one like fluid motion. My description isn't doing it justice. It it looked absolutely incredible, and they did a lot of really cool stuff in this match. So it had like that action that you expect out of a cruiserweight or a junior heavyweight title match, and it had the story and emotion to complement all of that. So uh, especially with Osprey working over uh, Hiromu's head and neck, uh, which is obviously where he got hurt. And I thought that added a lot to the match. I thought it was an excellent, excellent match. And again, arguably the best match of the weekend. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And, and it was all the more satisfying that Takahashi walked out with the belt, too. Uh, I thought that was great. So, and especially fitting that he got to go into Liger's retirement match as the IWGP heavyweight champion. I thought that was really cool. And it may have been done by design so that Liger's last match was against the IWGP junior champion. But I think it works well from a storyline perspective when you look at... Um, Hiromu's story and his rise to get back to this point. So uh, hats off to both guys. I thought this match was absolutely stellar. Great, great stuff. And I can't remember a time... I, I've watched all the Wrestle Kingdoms. I can't remember a time where I felt like the junior heavyweight title match. Even though there have been some great ones, I can't remember one where I thought that might have been the best show of Wrestle Kingdom. And that's really impressive on this show when you look at it, it was a two-night event with some really big matches. So... Uh, yeah, the junior heavyweight title match I thought was excellent. Uh, arguably the best match of night one. Uh, and of the entire weekend. And next up, uh, we had Tetsuya Naito uh, versus Jay White, the champion for the IWGP Intercontinental Championship. The first match of the double belt dash, where we were going to crown a double champion, a uh, holder of both the world and the IC titles, for first time ever. And I thought this was probably... Um, I thought the match was good. It was kind of a tale of two halves where I thought the first half of the match was really slow and kind of dry. And the second half had picked up with a lot of the counters that they were doing to each other and, and Gato's interference to almost prevent Naito from winning it. Gato, by the way, Gato might be the best manager in wrestling today as far as being a shit heel, like of a Bobby Heenan level, like getting involved when he's not supposed to. And I'll have more to say when I talk about Night 2, but I think Gato's actually, he's great in his role and I fucking hate that guy. And it, it's fantastic. Um, I think he's great. But the match, um, I think the biggest problem with this match is that it went too long. I think, it, I'm looking at the times here, it went 33 minutes, and I'm like, you could have cut, like, 13 minutes off of that, I think, and you would have been just fine. Maybe even more than that. It's, uh, I, I get it's a title match that's part of, like, a huge main event setup, and you want it to feel epic, but the problem with this match over the next match, which was actually longer, but that one was more exciting because I didn't know who was going to win, 
This one, I absolutely knew that Naito was going to win. I, I, Of the four guys, I was like, okay, I can see Ibushi winning it all. Boy, I was wrong. And I can see Naito winning it all. And I can see Okada winning it all. I see absolutely no chance in hell of Jay White walking out of Wrestle Kingdom with both belts. That is not going to happen. So I knew Naito was going to beat him. And so the match dragging on as long as it did seemed like a misstep. Because it's like, okay, just get to the point. We know Naito's going to win. So I think you could have cut this match down considerably and it would have been much better. It, it kind of reminds me of my criticism of Rock and Cena from WrestleMania 28. I was like, yeah, it's a good match. It, it absolutely is a good match. But maybe went a little longer than it needed to. You probably could have shaved about 10 minutes off of that. You know, maybe Rock wouldn't have gotten gassed and that would have made it better. You know, little things like that. Uh, it doesn't. Not every match needs to be half an hour long. So, uh, yeah, I thought the match was good. I was happy Naito won, so it was effective in doing what it was supposed to do, is set up Naito as the champion. But it is, maybe went a little long. Probably it, For me, it was the weakest of the four big title matches of, of night one, for sure. Uh, by far, it was the weakest of the four. But that brings us to the main event, Kazuchika Okada defending the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion uh, Championship against the G1 Climax winner, Kota Ibushi. This was great. This match was absolutely great. It lived up to all my expectations. Uh, I really like the bits and, and this thing that Ibushi does where he like goes into psycho fugue state mode where it's like you can't hurt him and he just turns into a psycho. And those close fists he was hitting Okada with, it was like, this is brutal. Like this actually feels brutal. And they talked about on commentary how he was risking disqualification by doing that and uh, all the great stuff that was going on. And I, again, I did not know who was going to win this match. I know I picked Ibushi to win both belts. But I was like, but it's Okada. I could see Okada winning this match. So I was enthralled by the entire thing. Because it was um, just this long, epic contest of who is going to win. And it was a journey that was worth following and a question that was worth answering. Uh, ultimately, Okada got the win. I felt bad for Ibushi after it was done. But Okada got the win. And you get the... Uh, the meeting of the two champions post-match with Naito making it clear that uh, he's coming for Okada uh, tomorrow night. And so that was really cool to get that set up, but I thought the main event was great. I thought it was an excellent closer to night one and set the stage perfectly for what we were going to see in night two's main event, uh, the battle for both championships. So with that, that concludes night one. Let's go into night two, shall we? Uh, night two opened up with the final match of the legendary Jushin Thunder Liger. Jushin Thunder Liger and Naoki Sano took on Hiromu Takahashi and Ryu Lee, not Dragon Lee. I keep having, I, I, I'm gonna slip up and keep calling him Dragon Lee, so hopefully that's okay. That's gonna be hard to get used to, but um, yeah, this fairly, um, on paper, fairly basic junior heavyweight title match, uh, not glamorous final match for Jushin Liger. Uh, opening bout, uh, would be a standard match on any other card, but it's Liger's retirement match, so I wanted to see it. And I think that added an extra layer of emotion to this match that it wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, I think on any other card, this would have been like another throwaway tag match uh, for New Japan, but as is, it's like I was absolutely glued to this match because it's the final time I'm going to see Jushin Thunder Liger work a match. And um, I got emotional. Uh, I got really invested in it. Now, again, going into this, I knew that Liger was going to lose because I just knew they're going the traditional route here. Liger's going to go out on his back. I totally know that. But while watching the match and the match kept going, and the match itself was pretty good. I thought it was a pretty solid uh, final match for Liger. Uh, obviously, he had a really solid performance. Got to go out on a high note where he didn't embarrass himself or anything like that. A really strong performance all around for, for Jushin. As the match was progressing... And there was one point towards the end where Sano got taken out and it was Liger trying to fight off both Hiromu and Lee. And I was like, come on, Liger, come on, Liger, win it one last time. And I really wanted Liger to win. I knew he wasn't going to, but they sucked me in uh, with this match. And of course, Hiromu, the reigning IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, defeated Jushin Thunder Liger, pinned him in the middle of the ring for the final match of Liger's career. And... Um, you know, you saw, uh, there was the bit where Hiromu uh, looked down at Liger and said, I will carry on your legacy. And the part that got me where the waterworks really started to come out was when I think Liger was like shaking hands with Sano. And then he turned around to shake hands with Dragon Lee. And Dragon Lee immediately... See, I told you, I'm going to call him Dragon Lee by mistake. Uh, Ryu Lee immediately fell to his knees and bowed down to Liger. And that moment, like made me well up with tears. I was like, oh, 
Liger's got to go. Oh, no. And it was so emotional, and you could tell that, especially the next night. I'm going to talk about New Year's Dash as well. But you could tell that like this was emotional for a lot of guys, not just Liger, but for a lot of people involved in this and, and the impact that Liger has obviously made on so many careers. Um, it was an honor to watch it. I was emotionally invested in the match. It was one of my favorite parts of the show, just for that alone. And a really classy send-off for a great legend in Jushin Thunder Liger. But I've got more to say about that because I've got to bring up New Year's Dash at some point. So uh, let's go over the rest of this card. Uh, next up is the Bullet Club, Taiji Ishimori and El Fantasmo taking on Rapongi 3K, Show and Yo for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships. This was really good. I thought this was a very good match. Um, clear cut heels with Bullet Club, clear cut faces with Show and Yo. Uh, Show actually had a bit of a breakout performance. He was like, man, he shows really good. And uh, I admit to not watching Rapongi 3K a ton. Um, I kind of watch them whenever they're on the big shows, but I don't like follow their work super closely. But show really impressed me in this match. And uh, Taiji Ishimori, who's an absolute freak as an athlete, that dude's insane. Uh, and not necessarily in the stuff he does, but it's like everything he does looks so fluid. Like he's just so crisp, and he, he's ama- and has an amazing look too. It's just everything about him. He's just a like a perfect athlete. It's really weird. And, and El Fantasmo, who was, you know, was, had made a reputation for dick-punching people all the way leading up to this show. So you had all these story components going on. You had faces, you had heels, and you had this one heel that kept doing this thing that gave him wins. And then Sho and Yo overcame that by wearing a cup. I was like, oh, the dick punch didn't work. And then Rapongi 3K overcame it, defeated Bullet Club, and now they are the new IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. Uh, this is just wrestling 101 booking. You build up heels, you have them get heat by doing something bad, and then when it's time to have the fall at the big show, the faces beat them by overcoming the thing that they always do bad, that they typically get away with. But this night, it didn't work. And that's, again, it's wrestling 101. It's solid. It's great. I loved it. I thought the match was very, very good. And it was nice to see a title change as well. So uh, overall, really entertaining match. I really liked it. Next up... Oh boy, oh boy, I'm getting giddy talking about this one. Zack Sabre Jr. successfully defending the British Heavyweight Championship against Sonata. (laughs) I know I've said it a lot on this channel whenever I talk about Zack Sabre Jr., but it bears repeating. Zack Sabre Jr., as far as straight-up technical ring work goes, and psychology and technical ability... Zack Sabre Jr. is probably my favorite worker to watch in the business today. Like, in the ring, when the bell rang, and you know, we can talk about promos, and he's not the best promo, he doesn't have the best look, but in the ring, when that bell rings, there's no one I enjoy watching more, because everything he does is just masterful. The dude is a fucking artist, and the ring is his canvas. He is outstanding. And he seems to mesh well with just about everybody. Like, I've never seen his technical style clash with anybody poorly. Like, he works well with Okada and the big uh, main event players. He works well with the junior heavyweights. He works well with bigger guys. He works well with just about everybody. He is an absolute master in there. And Sonata, more of like a high flyer type of guy, a hard hitting style as well. And I thought the two meshed really well. And basically this match was about them trying to inflict each other's style on each other. And whoever could dictate the pace of the match. And I thought all the counters that they did and all the uh, um, the, the chain wrestling and whenever they did do a big spot. Because that's another thing about Zack Sabre Jr. He doesn't do a lot of big spots. He just, like most of his stuff is, is him just in the ring trading holds. And it's amazing. I watch, like every little detail he puts into it. He makes it look like he's killing a guy. I, I, uh... I know I reviewed this match in the past, in the past, but I watched him have a match with Tanahashi where he just worked over his injured leg, injured leg the entire match, and I thought he was killing him, and it was amazing. And that's all they did the whole match. It was great. I think it went for like half an hour. I'm like, dude, this is fucking amazing. I loved it, and I loved this match too. I thought it was one of the uh, not the best match of the weekend, but certainly I would say top five probably of the weekend, which is saying a lot because I liked most of the matches on this show on both shows. So it was, uh, I thought this match was great. It was, uh, didn't go too long. I thought it was um, very entertaining. Great showcase for both guys. Zack Sabre Jr. got the win, which made me happy because I love the guy. 
And it was it was great. It was just a really good match between two guys that... And I was kind of looking to this match to be kind of the sleeper hit of the weekend, and I think it was. I think, you know, it didn't have the buildup of, say, the junior heavyweight title match or the double dash or, or you know, it didn't have necessarily the big stars like a John Moxley or Chris Jericho or Okada or anybody like that. But I was looking at its placement on the card, and, like, this could be, like, a huge, like, uh, sleeper hit. And I think they achieved that in spades. I thought it was really, really good. It was great, and I loved it. Uh, so thank you once again, Zack Sabre Jr., for entertaining me, and thank you for Sonata for working a really good match with him. I really enjoyed it. Next up was the second U.S. title match of the weekend as John Moxley successfully defended against Juice Robinson. I thought the match was good. I thought it uh, felt like a, a big fight between the two. And I think these two have really good chemistry together. I like their previous matches more, and I thought the Texas Death match from the night before was way better than this. But overall, I thought it was a really good, solid match with Moxley successfully retaining, uh, with some nice hard hits, some really good German suplexes thrown in there, and great use of the left right, uh, the left hand of God uh, from Juice Robinson. So a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, never rose to the level of being like a truly great match, but I thought it was a really, really good one and a nice, solid title match for Moxley. But the real story came in the post-match, where New Japan proves that they are masters of giving me exactly what I want before I even know I want it. Minoru Suzuki comes out and challenges John Moxley and gives him a gotch pile driver and leaves him laying. And I'm like, oh. Oh, I want that match so badly. I, you got that psychopath, Minoru Suzuki who I've said many times before is legit the scariest dude in pro wrestling, going up against John Moxley, one of the most unpredictable crazy men in wrestling. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know when that match is happening. It might happen at a new beginning. They might wait all the way to Dominion. I don't know. I don't care. I'm there. Whenever that match happens, I am fucking there. Um, just, just, say, just say the word New Japan and then shut up and take my money because fuck. I want to watch that match. So that was one of my favorite moments of the weekend. Is like just planting the seeds for that match. I'm like, oh, oh my god, I want to bathe in that awesomeness. That is going to be so cool. Uh, really looking forward to that. So uh, next up, we had Hiroki Goto defeating Kenta to become the new Never Open Weight Champion. This is the payoff to Kenta's betrayal of Shibata and Goto coming back to uh, avenge his friend, as it were. And I thought the match was. Um, I thought it was solid. I thought very much like the Jay White uh, Naito match from the from night one. I thought maybe it dragged a little bit, and this wasn't you know super super long. It was how long? Sixteen minutes. But I felt like it it felt like it took a while for it to click. Um, uh, Kenta was great in this as a heel, just a total dickhead heel, and Goto looked like he wanted to rip his head off. So uh, that I thought both guys conveyed their emotions well enough, but there was something lacking in the middle that just kind of lost my interest a little bit. I don't know what it was exactly, but um, the good news is it ended with a fucking stiff fest where they were beating the shit out of each other. Like they had the type of match that I would expect for the never open white title because you know my exposure exposure to the title was guys like Makabe and Ishii and Hanma and guys that could have these really stiff fucking matches. So it kind of like, it didn't really start out that way, but it ended that way with them just beating the tar out of each other. I'm like, okay, that was cool. So, you know, maybe, you know, s solid beginning, lagged in the middle a little bit, came back strong and had a nice ending, especially with Goto winning, uh, avenging his friend Shibata and ultimately winning the title and stripping the title from Kenta. It would have been nice if Shibata was out there to kind of like, punctuate the moment a little bit but as is i thought it was a, a solid good match maybe not as good as some people thought it was going to be but it was it was good enough i guess but uh again i did have some minor disappointments with it and then from there we had jay white taking on cody ibushi the battle of the two losers from night one uh with jay white getting the win thanks to what can best be described as a shit ton of interference from gato and a shit ton of cheating from jay white um I could see people not liking this match because um, uh, I heard a complaint online that it was too American with uh, kind of the gimmicky overbooking and everything, but, and maybe this is the American fan of me, I actually really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was, it maybe it was a bit of a three ring circus, but I kind of enjoyed the three ring circus and they've kind of made that, um, Jay White is kind of the Japanese, well he's not Japanese, but he's Australian, but you know, for the Japanese promotion equivalent to like a JBL, where it's like, 
somehow that motherfucker keeps winning even though he cheats like a you know even though he's like nowhere near as good as like Okada or uh, or Ibushi or anybody or Naito or anybody like that he keeps winning because he fucking cheats up a storm and never gets caught and I and when he when it doesn't work it blows up in his face and he loses but um, yeah I thought I kind of enjoyed the match even though, yes the match is totally like a three ring circus but I kind of enjoyed it and Ibushi took the loss, which was shocking to me that he came out of this event as the two-night loser. I'm like, oh, jeez. That's bad. Of course, he followed it up with kind of a rebound win the next night. And there's some teasings that him and Tanahashi are going to be a tag team, which that's interesting. I don't know if that's a demotion for Ibushi. I feel like that's a demotion for Ibushi. But, you know, if him and Tanahashi go on and become this great main event level tag team, they could get some really big, high quality uh, main events out of it as well. So I'm a little excited for it. But, uh, yeah, I picked Ibushi to win both nights, and he didn't even come close. He came in, he didn't even get a medal. He was in fourth place. It's like, oh, my God. I I, I backed the wrong horse on that one. But uh, I thought the match was entertaining. Again, Ibushi uh, broke out all of his great stuff, including the, the psycho fugue state thing. And Gato being the the modern day Japanese Bobby Heenan, I thought was really good as well. So I enjoyed all of that. And uh, again, I could see this match not working for everybody, but it worked for me, and I really enjoyed it. And I felt bad for Ibushi after it was over. Um, but again, it looks like him and Tanahashi are going to be a tag team. We'll see how they go from there. But uh, following that up, we have the battle of the Ace and Le Champion. Chris Jericho taking on Hiroshi Tanahashi. Um, many people are making fun of Jericho for his physique. Uh, a little bulkier, a little a little flabbier. It's weird. His physique is kind of reminding me of mine, where it's like, I tone up. I do ab exercises, but it's like, I can never get it to not look flabby. It's really strange. And it's like, I don't know if it's my diet or if I'm just too old or what. I don't know. But it's, it's it, I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't look flabby necessarily, but it's like, I have a hard time getting getting definition. And Jericho it, like has that you know pancake batter type body, and it's really strange. And it's it's not that Jericho can't perform; he can still do all the stuff, you know, the springboard drop kick, the line salt, all that other stuff. But it's like, dude, just tone up a little bit, and you'll you know people won't be making fun of you online. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I thought the match was very good. I thought these two meshed together really well, and they had that kind of like main event level match that you would expect out of these two uh, with some of the great counters like countering the high five flow into the code breaker and Jericho being a dick by grabbing the camera and flipping it off and all sorts of other things going on um, I thought this was a uh, a very very good match not Jericho's best in New Japan I still think that goes to the Omega match and I probably liked uh, his first match with Naito a little bit more but uh, overall I thought this was very very good and now it's like I don't know what Jericho does with New Japan now because he's kind of worked with all the the biggies, like the Tanahashis, the Omegas, the Okadas, and the Naitos, so, uh, I don't know, but Jericho got the win, which surprised me, won it with the Lion Tamer, um, uh, but, I don't know, we'll, we'll see, uh, what Jericho ultimately does, but, uh, yeah, I, I thought the match was very good. And from there, let's wrap up Wrestle Kingdom Night 2 with the main event, both titles on the line, World Heavyweight Champion Kazuchika Okada taking on Intercontinental Champion Tetsuya Naito, both championships up for grabs, and New Japan did it! They gave both belts to Naito, giving him his big moment at the end of Wrestle Kingdom that he always wanted, and the ride along the way was a great main event. Uh, the stakes were huge, uh, the stage was set for something big, and we got it. I thought it was another excellent match between these two. Probably the best match I've seen these two have together, because this is their third Wrestle Kingdom outing, and... Um, yeah, I think this one's probably my favorite. Maybe the title change and the circumstances involved kind of elevate it significantly. But, uh, yeah, I thought this was an absolutely outstanding match. Again, great counters. I think my only complaint, I probably would have had Naito win it on the Stardust Press rather than just hitting another Destino. But other than that, very good stuff all around. Great main event. And it was a big moment for Naito, especially... Uh, I really like the shot uh, post-match of um, Okada throwing his fist up in the air to congratulate Naito. I thought that was very, very cool. And, you know, this is a story that goes all the way back to Wrestle Kingdom 8, where Naito famously got shafted uh, from the main event, even though he was the defending World Heavyweight Champion. The fans voted the IC title match to get placed over him and as the closing main event spot. And ever since that's, that's kind of fueled this major change and uh, rejuvenation of Tetsuya Naito's career with the forming the LIJ and getting the whole Tranquilo personality going and becoming 
arguably the most popular star in New Japan. Um, when he didn't beat Okada the last time they faced each other in the Dome, I thought maybe they had kind of missed the boat, and it was like, all right, maybe it's never going to happen, and uh, maybe they missed their chance. But they did it here, and it came off great, and I was very happy with it. It's like, okay, let's see what Naito can do as World Heavyweight Champion now, especially since he has his first challenger lined up, as Naito will be defending both championship belts at New Beginning. Uh, at least based on what I've heard, he's going to be defending both belts against the man that attacked him right after he won both belts and ruined his celebration, Kenta. I think this probably would have worked better if Kenta was still the never openweight champion. I'm at a point where I'm like, dude, you need less belts. So any way you can kind of like cram it all together and not have so many belts, that would be great. It sounds like they're going to keep both championships, the IC and world title. They haven't unified them, which I'm like, you can go ahead and unify those. I think it's like, eh, you know, why not? Uh, you've got so many belts as it is. You know, you've got the world, IC, US, never. I mean, that's four singles titles for the heavyweights alone. And that, then you throw the junior heavyweight title on top of that and, you know, other titles that make their way into New Japan and get defended, like the British heavyweight title. It's like, oh my God, there's too many belts. Oh, uh, way too many belts. I, I, again, I've already mentioned the tag division and how there's too many belts there. So it's, um, they could shorten the number of belts. So I would have, so my line of thinking was, it's like, okay, if not, if T Kenta was still the never open weight champion, then he could go up against the double champion Naito and then, you know, the winner of that match would be the triple champion and you'd have like uh, less championships to worry about. It actually mean a lot more to have a belt when there's less to fight for. But yeah, look, they're not going that route, but that's a shame. Uh, but in any case, I thought the beatdown uh, was very shocking to do at the end of Wrestle Kingdom. I thought it came off well. Uh, I would have expected something like that to happen at the end of New Year's Dash because they normally do like a really hot angle at New Year's Dash, which they didn't really do this year. I guess you could say... Um, Liger's retirement was kind of the big thing, and that was the major draw of New Year's Dash anyway. I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, as an ending to Wrestle Kingdom, I thought it worked well. I thought it uh, set up set the stage for Kenta versus Naito very well. And here's hoping that match goes well, and we'll see where it goes uh, with Naito as champion or if he's going to be champion past New Beginning. Again, we shall see. But uh, I'll talk briefly about New Year's Dash. I kind of alluded to it earlier. There's not a whole lot to really talk about because everything they did was just kind of a... Uh, set up for future matches but without doing like the hot angle like and that's one of the t big things about new year's dash is that there's always like that hot angle that gets people talking and i don't think that really happened as lar as far as future storylines go i again i think the hot thing happened at the end of wrestle kingdom where kenta attacked the double champion and made his intentions clear and ruined naito's big celebration which worked um and I, again, like I said, Liger's retirement was a big enough deal to make New Year's Dash worth it. But everything else is just kind of like, okay, they're setting up this and they're setting up that. It's like, okay, that's fine. And to that end, it was effective. But it just, it didn't have like that super hot, like, oh my God, AJ's been kicked out of the Bullet Club. Or, oh my God, um, Jay White's joined the Bullet Club. Or, you know, that type. It didn't have anything crazy like that, like you would have expected from New Year's Dash. But, um... It set up some matches that I'm interesting in, uh, that I'm interested in. Again, Suzuki and Moxley. I want to see that. Um, Zack Saber Jr. versus Will Ospreay. Please, dear God, give me that. That would be great. Um, again, setting up Ibushi and Tanahashi as kind of a tag team moving forward. Uh, so we'll see how all of that goes. Uh, but the major thing, obviously, coming out of New Year's Dash was the retirement ceremony for Jushin Thunder Liger, which was very emotional, very classy, very well done, and definitely worth checking out. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend go checking it out. It's a very wonderfully well done moment um, and a nice send-off for Jushin Thunder Liger. Uh, his wife and son came out, which I'm sure brought out the tears in a lot of people. Very emotional. Uh, Tanahashi broke down and cried at one point. Um, they sang his theme song on the way out. A lot of great stuff uh, during that moment. It was just a, a wonderful and fitting farewell to a great wrestling legend, the great Jushin Thunder Liger, who, as I've said before, was one of the first guys that was a Japanese talent that got some exposure here in America that I became a fan of. It was him and Muda. Those were my two guys. And I thought they brought um, kind of a... I, I always appreciated the, th the theatrics of wrestling, but they did it in a different way. Like, Liger did not look like anybody else in the States, but he looked like a superhero, and I wanted to see more of him. And Muda looked like some scary as fuck dude that really captured my attention because I like scary as fuck dudes. 
uh, but with a little bit more of like a mystical, mysterious edge to him that uh, a lot of guys didn't have at the time. Undertaker had it, but uh, a lot of other guys did not. So those two really stood out to me. I was a big fan of what they've done and, and their work. And I said, I remember I said long ago in a previous video, I said that Sting was the guy that made me a wrestling fan because prior to him and being exposed to him in WCW, I was strictly a WWF fan. But once I discovered Sting, that branched me off into something else different. And then through Sting, I became familiar with Great Muda and that got me interested in Japanese wrestling uh, down the road. And then... Liger started showing up. He famously had the first match in Nitro history, that match with Brian Pillman, and the the rest, as it were, were our history. And I've been a fan of Jushin Thunder Liger ever since, and it's uh, sad to see him go, but he's had an amazing career. And thank you, Liger, for everything that you've done and everything that you did and uh, all of your great accomplishments and your great body of work. Uh, you have earned this retirement, and I'm glad to say that you got to go out with your head held high. Even if you did go out on your back, as per tradition, uh, you went out... Um, you got a worthy send-off, and that was all amazing to me. So uh, if you watch nothing else from New, Year da New Year's Dash, make sure to watch the Liger Retirement Ceremony. I thought it was great. But that finally concludes uh, this video. This one went way longer than I intended. But again, Wrestle Kingdom was pretty long, so I guess I shouldn't be surprised that it ended up going long. But uh, that is all I have for you now. Thanks again, everybody, for watching, and stay tuned for more videos in 2020. I have more lined up for you. Uh, my next video is going to be non-wrestling-centric. Uh, it's actually going to be another Star Wars review. I lied to you all when I said the last one was going to be my last Star Wars review, but it's not going to be a book review. Uh, I just, I finally saw The Mandalorian, and I want to talk about The Mandalorian, especially after my last Star Wars video was kind of a downer. Uh, I actually did enjoy The Mandalorian, so I want to talk about it and do a full-fledged review of it. And I think that'll be a better closure point for my Star Wars uh, video review. My last regular Star Wars video reviews. Let's go out on a high note. Let's be positive. Uh, but that's all I have for you now. Thanks again, everybody, for watching. Um, uh, I'm going to have way more lined up for you uh, as we go through January. There's going to be a lot to talk about with all the shows coming up. But um, take care. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody, to one and all. Thanks again, everybody, for the support. And welcome 2020. I think it's going to be a fun year.